Re Q A. Hi guys, it's me again. Today on the Great Precure Watchening, we're talking about the third entry in the Precure series that also serves as a soft reboot. I'm talking, of course, about Futariwa Pretty Cure Splash Star. Let's get into it. So with Splash Star, my entire experience with it came from poking around on the Precure wiki. I hadn't really seen a lot of people talking about it in my limited dealings with the Precure fandom. All I really knew was that it was an attempt at a soft reboot of the series with very similar protagonist, character design, and overall structure. I'll admit I definitely wasn't impressed with the look of it right off the bat, and like with Max Hart, I remember reading that it wasn't as popular as the original series. Splash Star begins with our two protagonists, Saki and Mai, meeting as young children as they chase spirits at a festival and wind up in front of the Sky Tree, an absolutely enormous tree on the edge of their hometown. Five years later, they meet up there again when Mai moves back into town. They meet a flower spirit and a bird spirit named Flappy and Choppy, and become the legendary warrior's pretty cure in order to save them. Together, they're tasked with rescuing the miracle drops from the villainous Darkfall and restoring the various fountains that give life to the land of fountains. The basic setup is very similar to Futariwa Pretty Cure and Max Heart. There are two main magical girls who rely on each other to transform and perform magical attacks, they have very little in common, mascot shenanigans, monster of the week scenarios, and so on. There's an evil group trying to destroy the world as well, but that's the plot of basically every Pre Cure series. The main difference here is that in the original two, the Dark Kingdom hadn't already taken over or destroyed the Garden of Light, whereas in Splash Star, the Land of Fountains has already been pretty well decimated and the heroes are trying to restore it and keep the same thing from happening to the Land of Greenery, which is the ordinary world they live in. I'll get more into this later, but even though the characters definitely take a lot of cues from the original series, to me it doesn't necessarily feel like it's just a recolored or discount version of the original. There are enough changes made to keep it feeling fresh while still staying in its comfort zone. Some of my favorite episodes include the episode where a bunch of classmates go to meet Kenta's family and check out their business. Any episode featuring Kenta Reski, but especially his and Mizu Shitatari's final episode. The one where Kaoru and Machiru help out at Saki's bakery. And, of course, the final softball game. <sighs> oh, honey. Boy howdy, the outfits in this series are... something. Cure Bloom and Cure Gret are... All right, and even Cure Windy isn't that bad. But poor Cure Bright. Oh, Saki, my sweet precious girl, look what they did to you. Right, okay, so it's not all bad. At least they still have the big cloth boot covers and chunky shoes. I seriously love those things. I like that Saki gets to have shorts under both her outfits, as that's always something I like in Magical Girl outfits. Oh, I also like the big ribbony things on Wendy's outfit, and I like that the symbols on their sleeves around their hands and wrists are more specific to them instead of just hearts. I think the hearts worked just fine for black and white, but since this series isn't generally themed around finding similarities in people you wouldn't expect to, I like this change. Honestly, yeah, it's mostly just Bright's outfit I don't like. Precure loves them some flouncy outfits with big puffy skirts and lots of layers, and normally I'm all over it like white on rice. But in this case, I think it just looks wild and all over the place. The weird, vibrant yellow-green color doesn't help much either. Also, even if they aren't technically cures, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about Kaoru and Machiru's outfits. I'll get more into their whole deal in a minute, but for the short time that they get to have magical girl transformations, I really liked their outfits. They're more understated than the official Precure outfits by virtue of not looking like this, but even then, they're a lot simpler than any of the other Magical Girl outfits we see in the series, especially Splash Star. I like them, though. I think they strike a nice balance between being a full Precure outfit and the simplicity of their original plain outfits. Plus, because they're less over the top, they don't draw the attention away from the actual stars during the series' climax. And, um, well, the less I say about the hair, the better. Anyway, like a lot of things in this series, the transformation sequence takes a lot of cues from the original. Once again, the girls have to hold hands to transform, which I always like, and we've gone back to parts of their outfits appearing one at a time instead of all at once. All in all, it's a nice transformation sequence. Not a lot to say about this one. I actually really love the main theme of Splash Star. Leave It To Us Splash Star is a peppy, perky song with a really nice vocalist and sweet instrumentals. I love the strings in the background. Do I think it's better than Danzen? No, absolutely not. Does that mean it's bad? No, absolutely not. It's fun, and I like the whole opening. 
Something I think is really cool is that after they get their secondary forms, Cure Bright and Cure Windy appear in the opening, replacing certain shots of Bloom and Egret. But honestly, it's kind of forgettable, and certainly not in my top 5 Precure openings. As for ending themes, this time around we had Go by Smiling is Victory and Ganbalan's The Dance. They... sure do exist. Just like the original series, I skipped over these ones. Again, I don't watch end themes when I'm binging a series unless I really love them, and I didn't love these. Don't get me wrong, they're alright, just really not my favorites. I'm certainly not adding them to my Precure playlist on Spotify anytime soon. Honestly, with Ganbalan's The Dance, I think I just have a knee-jerk reaction to it because I associate it with Yes Precure 5 and Gogo, -Go, since it was also used as the second ED for both of those series. I won't go into all that right now, just that I think it's neat that they use the same ED for three different series, even if I'm not a huge fan of the song itself. Saki and Mai are great! I have no idea how popular of an opinion this is, but I don't think they came off as just Nagisa and Hinoko wearing wigs. The basic bare bones of those characters are there for sure. Appearances aside, Saki and Nagisa are both jocks with bad grades who love food, while Mai and Hanoka are quieter nerds with good grades and a passion for steam. It would have been really easy to just make them baseball Nagisa and art Hanoka and call it a day, but they didn't. Saki is a bit more energetic than Nagisa, who is already plenty energetic, and has a better relationship with her family than Nagisa does. Her family also runs a bakery, which is neat, and the first in a long, long line of cures whose families run small businesses. The backbone of our society! Anyway, Saki is great, but Mai is my favorite, probably because she's an artist. This is already enough to distinguish her from Hanoka, whose passion is science, but she also has a tendency to get hyper-focused on her art, which Hanoka doesn't really do with her passions. She's also smart and kind, but does sometimes stress over avoiding conflict, like when she realized that Machiru and Kaoru were part of Darkfall, but didn't know how to bring it up or what to do about it. Also, we have the same birthday, November 20th. Doing the math, I think we're the same age even, or at most a year apart, which is wild. Somewhere, my Misho is having a millennial crisis. However, while I don't feel like Pretty Cure themselves were just the last group with a new coat of paint, I have a different opinion on the mascots. Flappy and Choppy really felt like they were just Meeple and Mipple again, but instead of being a schmoopy couple, Flappy just wouldn't shut the fuck up about his one-sided crush on Choppy. Other than that, he and Meeple were basically identical, and while Choppy was a bit more naive than Mipple, they're still basically the same character. Even Moop and Foop, the mid-season power-up mascots, felt like they were basically just Porun and Lulun, except that they actually got along with each other. Maybe it's because as mascots they don't get nearly the same amount of screen time or character development as the Cures, but even so, they were just kind of… fine at best. Not to mention, I find their designs incredibly lackluster. Precure mascots generally don't have anything to do with the theme for the season. Like, why is the main fairy for the music-themed series a cat? Why is the mascot for the witch-themed series a marketable teddy bear? Why is I-chan? But for these mascots specifically, their designs really annoy me because it feels like they weren't willing to do something different with the designs and just made them based on the relatively generic blank slate templates of the original. Again, in the original, I was willing to forgive some of that, but at this point, couldn't they have had, like, the bird mascot look like a bird and the flower mascot look vaguely flower-like? Is that so much to ask? Anyway, I liked the bad guys in this season the most out of all the villains so far. As much as I loved the ineffectual villain squad of Max Hart, the villains in Splash Star actually felt like they had distinct characters. The bad guys in the first two seasons didn't really feel like anything outside of the group they were a part of, like they were only interesting when they were together and the second one of them left the group to go fight Pretty Cure, they ceased having anything vaguely interesting about them. Like I said last time though, it wasn't necessarily bad to have the villains be a bit more generic in those seasons, but I definitely feel it's good that they did have a little more with the villains in Splash Star because it was going to wear thin pretty soon. So what's the villain gimmick this season? Well, there are five generals that go out to send Monsters of the Week called Uzaina this season, after Pretty Cure. They are Karihan, Moe Roomba, Dorodoron, Ms. Shitatare, and Kintoreski, plus Kaoru and Machiru. We also have Goyan, the... uh... Weird melon frog manservant guy, right hand of Akudaikan, the supposed main villain. Akudaikan is, once again, kind of a nothing character, just like the Dark King before him. However, unlike the Dark King, there's actually a Watsonian explanation for that. I'll get into that in the next section, but for now, I don't have much else to say about Akudaikan. He's just sort of there, this generic big bad evil dude looming menacingly over Darkfall and yelling at them about their failures. 
The other members of Dark Fall, however, are way more interesting. Well, except Karihan, who I keep forgetting exists, even though he's the first bad guy to show up. He's... fine. All five generals are themed around the element of the fountain they're in charge of. Karihan is in charge of the Fountain of Trees, and he's kind of quiet and solitary until his temper is provoked. That's about it for him. Then there's Moirumba, who's in charge of the Fountain of Fire, and he's a vaguely offensive flamboyant gay stereotype, and I love him. He has a crush on Karihan for some reason, and he loves to dance, and he was the first Precure villain that made me sit up and go, OH SHIT, SOMETHING DIFFERENT! After him came Dodoron with the Fountain of Earth, who is naive and childish and sulky and kinda dumb, and I liked him well enough, he was fine. Mis Shitatare, overseer of the Fountain of Water, is the stereotypical vain villainess, but I liked her fine. And of course, my number one boy, Kintoreski himself. He's in charge of the Fountain of Gold, and hands down he's my favorite character in the whole series. I'm a big, big sucker for super strong bad boys with a personal code of honor. He comes to Saki's shop and buys bread and befriends her family, and yet he doesn't stop being a villain at any point, and I love that! It's also worth noting that all five of them have a different approach to dealing with the cures. Mishiratare likes to use sneaky, underhanded tactics like kidnapping the mascots so they can't transform, while Dodoron uses a simple, direct approach. Again, Kintoreski is my favorite because he's not interested in beating the cures in an unfair fight, sometimes he just straight up fights them instead of relying on Uzaina, and also he continuously tries to stop their attacks with his bare hands. That's kick-ass! Love that guy! Also, Kintoreski, Ms. Shetatare, OTP. The straights can have some rights. Goyan, the creepy bastard, is present for the entire series. He's always goading the others, sending them after the cures with an if-you-have-time-to-lean-you-have-time-to-clean attitude. He's very much your stereotypical scheming advisor, always rubbing his weird little hands together. I kept waiting for the reveal that he was going to try and pull what the Seeds of Darkness did in the original series, betraying Akudaiken and attempting to take over Darkfall. What happened instead was way more interesting, especially since that plot point had already been used just a couple of seasons ago. Anyway, as a character, he's neat. I didn't pay him much mind while I was watching him because, like the other characters, I kind of dismissed him as generic villainous right hand with potential Starscream tendencies. The big two when it comes to Slash Star villains, though, are obviously Kaoru and Machiru Kiryu. They're twin sisters from Darkfall created by and beholden to Akudaikan just like the rest of them, originally in charge of the Fountain of Sky. However, since they mostly resemble middle school girls, they decide to infiltrate Saki and Mai's personal lives and take them down from the inside. This backfires spectacularly, and they wind up actually becoming friends, learning more about what it means to be human, and standing up against Akudaikan and the rest of Darkfall to protect them. You might notice that this is a vaguely similar arc to Kyria's from the original series, which I hated. I think it was done way better here. I'm not sure if it's because the implied romance element is taken out, or if it's because there's two of them so they can have their own individual redemption arcs that play off each other. Either way, I like it way more. The big thing with them, though, is that like Kyria, their redemption happens midway through the series, but unlike Kyria, it actually matters. Kyria is barely mentioned for the rest of the series and isn't brought up at all in Max Heart, but rescuing Kaoru and Machiru becomes a huge motivating factor for Saki and Mai until they finally manage to break out in return. Then finally, at the end, they get to transform into Pretty Cure! I shrieked when I first saw that. I was so happy that they got to fight alongside Saki and Mai with Precure powers and kick the ass of the guy who puts them through so much misery. Needless to say, I really liked Kaoru and Machiru. Unfortunately, like with the last two seasons, there weren't very many standout side characters, and honestly, there are even fewer in Splash Star than before. Princess Philia, the big good of this season, is even more of a non-entity than the Queen of Light was, and the Queen of Light was really only important in season finales and as a part of Hikari's story. Saki's cat Korone becoming an unwitting vessel for Philia towards the end was neat, though. The friend group wasn't nearly as important or memorable as the Futariwa Max Heart group. I feel like the great villains make up for it, but still, at this point the weak supporting cast was starting to feel like a theme, and it wasn't great. I feel bad because it's been a running thing now in my videos to spend way more time talking about the villains than the actual magical girls themselves. Um, yeah, as much as I do enjoy these five girls, none of them are even in my top 10 precure. They're fine, I don't dislike them, in fact I really do like them a lot. But I just don't have a lot to say about them, like, as characters. Sorry about that. Alright, so the big thing with the plot is the big twist at the end. In the original series, the Dark King is just kinda there, and it's a pretty generic plot. 
Slash Star's plot isn't much more complicated. There's a cool magical land that we have to restore one piece at a time, wahoo. Akudaikan is, in many ways, the Dark King's spiritual successor. He's a huge evil entity of shadows and darkness who wants to take over and or destroy the world for nebulous evil reasons. The main thing that sets him apart from the Dark King, though, is that he was artificially created by Goyan. Yeah, so up until the end, it seems like we had a Megatron and Starscream relationship going on with those two. We've got our massive, powerful, evil overlord, and his definitely very loyal second-in-command who totally won't turn on him and try to take over. Wink, wink. But no. In the last few episodes, we learned that Goyan actually created Akudaikan as a puppet leader for Darkfall, someone to do all the hard work while Goyan just had to sit back and wait for the results. It's a genuinely good twist that I don't think we've seen again in Pretty Cure. So, all that aside, how did I feel about the rest of the series? Um... Well, it's alright. It's very similar to Futariwa and Max Heart, but I also feel like there was more filler in Splash Star than those two. Contrary to popular opinion, filler isn't always bad. Filler, when used well, can be a great vehicle to add extra character development or learn more about the world. Not every episode has to be about moving the plot forward if you do it right. It just felt like there was more of it in Splash Star than the other two. Maybe it was about the same, and I could probably find out if I went and looked at the various episode lists, but I'm not going to do that, because I don't care that much. That's just how it felt while I was watching it, which is what's important here. As for themes, the overall theme is about appreciating and protecting the beauty of nature. The cure's motifs are based on the Buddhist idiom flower, bird, wind, moon, which is essentially a way of appreciating nature through smell, sound, touch, and sight. It's kind of neat, actually, that the Precure's themes are these, like, esoteric themes, with Splash Star having flower, bird, wind, moon, and the original Cure Black and Cure White having a yin-yang thing going. Also, Shiny Luminous is there. Anyway, I like the nature theme, but I wish it had been more of a factor in the story, outside of the main plot. That sounds weird to say, but aside from the main storyline with Darkfall and the Land of Fountains and all that, there weren't exactly a lot of filler plots or through lines about having to protect the Earth or the beauty of nature. The closest we get is regular trips to the Sky Tree and a moon viewing party late in the series. Futari Wa got away with a more basic, bare bones plot by virtue of being the first entry in the series and also having the main focus of the series be Nagisa and Hinoka's relationship. Splash Star spends a lot of time on Saki and Mai's relationship, it's true, but I personally feel that once you've picked a specific theme, like, for example, appreciating and protecting the beauty of nature, that should be reflected in as many aspects of your work as possible. But hey, that's just me. I'd also like to add that I loved the final fight. Most Pretty Cure seasons tend to have a lot of punching and kicking and actual physical attacks in addition to the magical attacks. And although they explained that away with, oh, uh, it's just spiritual power, don't worry about it, in this season, it still kicks ass. But my favorite is the final boss fight where it just straight up turns into Dragon Ball Z for a bit. I love it. Splash Star is an okay series. I see now why I didn't see many people talking about it before I watched it, and why I still don't see people talk about it. While it's not bad by any means, it's not the best Precure has to offer, and very few people are going to point to it as a place to start if you're interested in getting into the series. I think the main problem with Splash Star is that it lives in the shadow of Futariwa and, to some extent, Max Heart. Part of the reason it took me so long to get this video out is that I had originally decided when I was sitting down to write the script that I wasn't going to just compare it to Futariwa Max Heart because I wanted to judge it on its own merits. But several times throughout the writing process, I realized that was all I was doing, and eventually, I gave up. It's impossible to not compare Splash Star to the original two when talking about it, and I think that's a real shame. I like Splash Star a lot, but it's always going to be third best at most when talking about the Futariwa era. Would I recommend this series to someone? Maybe not as a jumping off point, but if someone asked me what Precure series to watch next, and they hadn't watched Splash Star, I definitely encourage them to give it a shot. I don't think it's the best introduction to the series, though. Well, that's a wrap on Splash Star. Next time, we'll be talking about two series again. Yes, Precure 5 and its sequel, GoGo. -Go. See you then!